Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Navid Garamani. I'm a student of medicine participating in neurology clerkship. Today, I will be presenting a spinal cord injury, orthopedic rehabilitation, uh, and neuropathic pain management. This is a novel approach in favor of empowering physiologic healing by utilizing recent technological advances to improve the quality of life by reducing the overall course of illness for individuals suffering from chronic spinal cord injury and its debilitating consequences. Um, in this lecture, I'd like to illustrate the multidisciplinary approach to the spinal cord injury management that requires orthopedic surgeons and neurologists oversight this field. Also, I'd like to highlight the sophisticated technologies that are available to help reverse the course of the illness uh, and can be incorporated into the routine daily management of the spinal cord injury patients. My approach is an original approach where I would be implementing this as a neurology resident or hired physician in uh, any hospital in the future. And the benefits that I will be introducing to the medical program would be risk reduction of medication overuse, risk reduction of unnecessary hospitalization, minimizing future various and organ complication. We'll go according to the following presentation outline, starting with chronic spinal cord injury, SCI management map, which is nearly the most important part of my presentation. And I present it to you right now. And then we end with uh, one surgical operation that I will demonstrate and one other device known as a spinal cord uh, decompression table. So this is the most important part of the lecture that I like to um, get our attention to. As a future neurology resident, I will establish patient relationship. I will establish diagnosis of a spinal cord injury to be chronic. I will evaluate pain and related deficits of the individual. We will obtain MRI of the spine, X-ray, vertebrae, and review medical records from other uh, doctors and consultations. So the first step in management that I am offering is modified diet and possible exercises that are doable. And that is to strengthen neuromuscular junction to, uh, to support the, the back pain uh, and uh, various difficulties that people with a spinal cord injury uh, experience. Establishing weight loss program is also very important. Start low dose pain medication once I start weight loss program. If these um, modalities didn't respond, then we go to number three. If pain persists, we will do psychological assessment, psychiatric evaluation. I will look for a major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, OCD, um, look into the eating disorders, or actually get a nutritionist uh, consult. People who have continuous amount of pain, they can become depressed. They, it is very debilitating to their lifestyle. And so their diet might be affected. So is the sleep. So on number four, we will do po uh, nocturnal polysomnography to uh, produce a complete record of their sleep pattern, whether the pain affects the sleep uh, or the sleep affects the pain. We will assess the medication overuse and interactions because no, it's not one problem, one person. Other people have different problems as well at the same time. Also, I will repeat consult of neurologist and orthopedic surgeon to find out whether there is surgery on further operation is needed. Now, it is best to offer a non-invasive modalities at first and the non-invasive modalities that I will be introducing to the medical residency program or spinal stimulation electrode placement, which we will go in extensive detail in this lecture, and the compression table that is rather an orthopedic concept for disc herniation remission uh, and radiculopathies. Uh, then um, both the compression uh, table and the spinal stimulations are used for post-op as well and pre-operations. We will assess for the therapy-related harms and modify therapy. All therapies, it is very important to know in medicine that once you start a therapy, the therapy itself can introduce harm. So I will discuss what are the harms that can be uh, produced to the patient while under therapy with us. And so we will minimize those. And then in the end, uh, closely monitor and assess the patient uh, for progression and remission. All right, so we'll go a little bit quicker from here on. Etiology, pathology of spinal cord injury, of course, we all know. Uh, there is physical injury, and then there is motor, sensory, and autonomic dysfunction. The physical injuries often caused by motor vehicle accidents, 38%, falls, 32%, gunshot wound, 14%, medication, and uh, medical or surgery, 4%, sports, 
Uh, acute and subacute spinal cord injury, it's depending on the time, uh, past 18 months, if symptoms are not uh, completely reversed, then it becomes chronic. Prior 18 months, we call it acute. Early acute is within 72 hours of incidence. The etiology of primary damage is usually locally restricted with vertebral fracture. There's hemorrhage and ischemia. Primary damage instigates secondary, and on a secondary basis of insult, we have glutamate exocytotoxicity. Um, it is very important to know that glutamate release and free radicals cause extension of the paralysis paresis uh, in the spinal cord injury. Now, on the inflammatory basis, there's timeline. And on 30, 30 to 45 minutes, we have TNF present. And within three hours to 24 hours, we have TNF alpha and interleukin-6. Uh, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and TNF alpha are highly correlated with the spinal cord injury and inflammatory processes. The body of human also has protective mechanism. Uh, the anti-apoptosis expression of the genes of glutathione can also protect a person. There's, there are also genes such as NAIP or Bruce or Survevin. Um, these are actually genes in human called inhibitor of apoptosis, apoptosis protein. They also protect human uh, during the course of injury. But if these, um, if these processes were, um, if these processes were sufficient, then then we wouldn't need uh, medication intervention. Spinal cord syndromes. Uh, are, so now we have a variety of spinal cord problems. Some of them are specific. For example, there's cauda equina syndrome. That is injury to lumbar or sacral nerve root, uh, lumbar or sacral fractures, um, pelvic fractures, and disc herniations are there. Um, so the spine architecture uh, dictates nerve injury pattern. Uh, I would like to point out that uh, we can, uh, the, the, the spine uh, is not a straight. The spine has a curvature. And if we take a look between the vertebrae, we have intervertebral foramina and a spine, a spinal nerve. Um, the most common anatomical site for a spinal cord injury is the junction where the spine curvature changes. Um, so, one of the longest uh, segments of a spine is thor thorax. Um, during thorax, for the thorax part, we know that the mid thoracic region is most susceptible to injury due to narrowing of the spine and not curvature changes. But for example, between thoracolumbar and lumbosacral, those are the places that you expect either um, vertebral fracture or nerve impingement or cervical thoracic. If you look in here, um, this diagram, uh, this graphic shows, this is a change of curvature from uh, in curve to an out curve, from convex to a concave. And that's just the typical lumbosacral region. The cervical region um, is less susceptible to injury due to more space around the cord. Now take a look, on a normal basis, 18.3 millimeter is the diameter of a spinal cord for average young man. And so as you go down and finish, uh, cervical area entering thoracic, it reduces so many millimeters is now 14.5 and onward it becomes uh, more slim. Now on the imaging, of course, we do MRI. This is a normal MRI where you expect, this is an actual MRI, but it's a little bit graphically highlighted. You can see cauda equina nicely floating in CSF. Uh, vertebral, there's no vertebral fraction and here you have the disc not protruded. However, if we had pathology, then an interesting finding would be um, on, on a cord compression, you can say, you can find it by no cerebral spinal fluid is visible anterior or posterior to the cord at the level of the compression. I learned this recently myself and I found it very interesting where of course it's logical to think when there's compression, it would squeeze the fluid out. Therefore there will be no visualization for CSF. So sometimes medicine is very obvious, but it just takes an observant eye to pay attention to it. Um, I learned this one just very recently. Um, high signal in the cord represent edema. So you can see edema of the bone right here. This is a bone edema and we have collapse of vertebral bone. So this condition clearly uh, signifies a typical 
spinal cord injury. Now, I like to start with a thinking process to grasp the complex complexity of a spinal cord injury. If everything was about muscle strength or sensory loss, then, then the spinal cord injuries wouldn't be this complicated as they are in reality. Because yes, there is a dermatome, there is perhaps there is a lesion here in the anterior commissure, and then you would lose the sensation on the skin. Um, is that such a big deal? Sometimes it may not be such a big deal to lose sensation of the skin. But it turns out that a spinal cord injury is not just about muscle strength or sensation of the dermatome. There is, um, I like everyone to think about this region. Does everybody remember the number one? What would be the name of the uh, nerve on number one? What would be the name of the nerve on number two? And actually this place, what sort of ganglion is this? And what would this be? Oh, it's labeled bladder. Um, but here, what we have, it's very important that to understand there is a concept called autonomic dysreflexia. Autonomic dysreflexia is the lesion that takes place at the lateral horn, where the descending autonomic neurons meet with the presynaptic neurons that run through the ganglionic chain, entering to the internal organs. Now, spinal cord injuries have, they're notorious for their autonomic dysreflexia problem. So even if the person is in the rehabilitation, autonomic dysreflexia take place along with other problems such as DVT or pulmonary embolism. Now let's talk a little bit about this autonomic dysreflexia. Um, a study of persons um, with a chronic spinal cord injury monitored in England for many years revealed an annual incidence of 23% of pressure ulcer and 20% of UTI. These are due to autonomic dysreflexia, and we will discuss that more. Um, autonomic dysreflexia, AD, potentially is a life-threatening sudden episodic increase in blood pressure, highly related to spinal cord injuries. Now reported in 48 to 91 percent of the people with a spinal cord injury above T6. Increased, and, and the methodology or pathology is increase in excitability of sympathetic preganglionic neurons due to the loss of supraspinal control so that nauseous stimuli result in inappropriately large bursts of sympathetic discharge. Therefore, this is in a spinal cord injury, loss of supraspinal control. Now, severe untreated cases may result in cardiac arrest, seizure, and death. Increase in systolic blood pressure greater than 20 to 40 millimeter mercury is somewhat a finding is a clinical pearl for us to know. Also look at the flushing above the flushing of the skin above uh, SCI, pyloerection, stuffy nose, blurred vision and anxiety. Now this region, I would like all doctors to uh, take a look in here. So above, we, we just discussed this is above T6. So let's find above T6, this is T6. So any injury above this area pertains this image on the left and on the left. So on these two patients, you would expect to produce highly strong management and observation for autonomic dysreflexia. Now, there is an interesting clinical pile for us to know, and that is typically on a DVT, um, we would have a typical observation. But let's see uh, if we have one of the typical observations for DVT is calf tenderness. But we just said patient has a spinal cord injury. So they would be lacking sensory so they're not going to report calf tenderness and then they end up having being bedridden for a long time and then they become uh, they will suffer from PE. Uh, so that is that is a clinical pearl that I found interesting. So DVT can present with fever of unknown origin in this case. So look for fever of unknown origin with a spinal cord injury patient and do not look for calf tenderness because they just lost their sensory modalities. Um, Again, this is one of the second things that I learned where logic uh, is there in medicine. Kind of obvious, but you learn to learn it, uh, see it. The risk of death from PE during the first year following a spinal cord injury is more than 200 times than a general population. Now, let's start the management of our patient. Um, the most important part is, yes, we diagnose spinal cord injury, but how are we going to serve our patients? There are so many um, continuously chronic pain uh, patients uh, around uh, US 
that are not receiving the good management that they expect. Now, I like this presentation to be an advocate for um, increasing a, a better management for our people. So a spinal cord injury management uh, strategies focus on identifying and eliminating nauseous stimuli, postural adjustment, and uh, if necessary, medications. Uh, we have to confirm um, the, the dysreflexia, autonomic dysreflexia with BP measurements. Uh, position patient in upright posture to facilitate blood pooling in lower limbs and reduce risk of cerebrovascular hemorrhage or hypertensive encephalopathy. Moving down, if elevated BP persists, medication options include nifedipine 10 milligram, bite and swallow, that means chew um, for more effectiveness uh, formulation with possible repeat dose after 30 to 60 minutes. So as we can give them gabapentin and uh, botulinum toxin sildenafil, I will review this one more time. Now, there is neuro a neurogenic shock that is a combination of the bradycardia and uh, hypotensive bradycardic, so that could be managed with atropine. And if we need to, we can uh, give dobutamine or dopamine. So vasopressors may be considered and to maintain mean arterial pressure at 85 millimeter mercury. As a neurologist, we would still have to be observant of this fact. Um, and, and that is also for acute patient and chronic spinal cord injury. So pain management with medications, uh, often anticonvulsants go for lancinating electric pains. Gabapentins are also there, 100 milligram POTID um, for major, uh, for more sedation effects. Uh, TCAs are for diffuse type of pain and uh, typical medication being used, baclofen, tizanidin, clonidin, diazepam and dantrolene, uh, gabapentin uh, are also there. Now, with this, I would like to start uh, discussing a spinal cord a stimulator and how it works. Um, as a prospective neurologist uh, resident, I would like to bring this technology to, to the residency program that I'm going to. And uh, this technique is actually a very simple technique. It requires a simple, um, operation where we, uh, spinal cord stimulator um, is consists of a thin wire that, uh, and a small pacemaker with a battery. The, the electrodes are placed between the spinal cord and the vertebrae. And, uh, and then there is, a, 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 there is electric impulse uh, constantly at the location of the pain. The operation is done when the patient is awake. I like to uh, jump to the video and start the video on that. So, here is the video. So a spinal cord stimulation is when you have the patient uh, suffering from the pain, um, we will, um, there is electrical wire, um, hold on. So a spinal cord stimulation is called also SCS. It is believed that the electrical signals um, a spinal cord stimulation uh, a simulation also called SCS uses electric impulses to relieve chronic pain of the back, arms, and legs. It is believed that electric signals at the level of the injury mask the pain uh, signal and brain perception is also altered. It's like a mask effect. Now, the main candidates are patients with neuropathic pain, paresthesia, who have failed to respond to pain medications. Uh, now, let's take a look at the operation. The injection site is anesthetized. Uh, an insulated wire lead is inserted through an epidural uh, into the epidural space via incision site. So that's the epidural, uh, and that is the wire that inserted into the epidural space. Then the electrodes as various spots on the lead produce electric pulses, um, electric pulses. In this operation, the patient is awake, alert, and oriented to time, person, and place. It's just a local anesthesia. And the doctor asked the patient, does this feel good? Is, is this location, you see it moves up and down. The physician moves up and down the electrodes that are on and the patient reports that this is a nice location. Then um, the electric wire is connected to a stimulator uh, for one week for a trial period. Um, the, uh, this, there, is a, there, is a, um, there is a pacemaker uh, that the electric lead on the other end 
get connected and the patient actually gets to walk away from the operating room um, with it. Uh, permanent implant, uh, so, so the electric wire is connected to the stimulator for one week and, and it is for a, a trial period. If the patient is happy with the result of this implantation, then a permanent implantation is uh, going to be placed and decided with the physician and the patient. So one more time, we are gonna have the epidural needle going there um, and the surgeon uh, anesthetize the patient. The patient is under a general anesthesia at this time and the patient is not awake or alert. Um, so the probe uh, enters and the surgeon already knows how far he needs to go. Uh, and then there is a implantable pulse generator that is planted under the skin. And uh, with an incision, it can go there. It's very small. And the probe can also get uh, inserted into the battery. The patient has a Bluetooth that can actually um, alter the amount of a stimulation his or her spine is going to receive to mask the pain effect at any time during the day. And to me, this is a fascinating technology where we've used the Bluetooth technology and electronics uh, to nearly uh, help people that have gone through so much operations uh, for cervical pain um, and, and various uh, spinal cord injury. And now they can actually have their normal quality of life back on track. Um, this was a brilliant technology that came to my mind and I really like to share that with you. As to review that the application for spinal cord stimulation is used after conservative pain management have failed. Um, there's cervical radiculopathy, uh, arachnoditis, spinal cord crush injuries, complex regional pain syndrome, phantom pain after amputation, perineal pain also. Um, and so spinal cord stimulation, uh, the electric impulse goes uh, via the interspinal implantation and we viewed the operation. This is another overview just for us to have it in the slides and remind ourselves, uh, this is a wonderful technology. And I think with a minimal, not minimal, but some uh, uh, training with a general surgeon, um, uh, I myself, uh, I can perform this operation after I get certified for it. Now, the second technology um, that I like to introduce is a spinal decompression technology, where these are non-invasive modalities for people who are hoping they can get their disc protrusion reversed and uh, their back pain or cervical pain uh, be relieved. So by relieving pressure in the spine, the increased circulation also occurs in the disc, which is vital for the disc healing and for return of the disc. Now, I would like to show um, this item as well. Um, so, this is a decompression table where the person is not quite tightly, but securely and gently placed uh, on a decompression table. Decompression table has uh, lumbar, cervical, and thoracic modalities. Um, and on this technology, sometimes the, the back moves up and down, or it actually stretches the spine. Um, with this, uh, we can adjust uh, for the hip wet, uh, different people have different size, so we don't want our patient to fall off the table. Um, so this is a wonderful technology where they help in a very, very uh, careful manner. They help um, stretching the spine and relieving uh, the, the disc protrusion. It is done for various levels, like this position is for lumbar. Um, so when they uh, place the patient with the foot rest, um, they, yeah, that's lumbar. Um, right. So let's see a different position um, on this video. And so as you can see, as you can see, the table moves up and down and you can help uh, a reversal of the disc protrusion. The patient can protect herself or himself if they feel uncomfortable by pressing that button. Also cervical um, adjustments are available for um, pain and discomfort over the shoulder and arms. I can continue this over 
our lecture here. Um, that's just to give us an idea. So this is also a wonderful technology. It's non-surgical spinal decompression for degenerative disc disease, um, bulge herniation, and um, various problems such as sciatica, which is not actually a medical term. It's a lame person term. We should say lumbar radiculopathy. Uh, and then there is post-laminectomy uh, syndrome, uh, opioid addiction due to pain management. These things can be uh, taken care of. It's interesting to understand that uh, the disc experiences a different force at different positions. So it seems like on, on the far left, this is the most uh, challenging position for a human uh, with a with a lumbar uh, or probably lumbar disc protrusion, and uh, I just wanted everyone to see that there are different levels, and of course it's intuitive. But here we have. So I'd like to present a case study that was done for the decompression machine, and this this is a final slide for us. There was an 18-year-old male involved in motor vehicle accident suffering from significant neck pain, headache, and bilateral upper extremity paresthesia. Um, and so the study found out uh, that, that here is um, pre-treatment. So the patient is experiencing, um, the patient experiences, uh, it says upon examination, he had a positive cervical uh, compression test restricted range of motion, right? So he is not, he's totally straight. He is not willing to move or bend uh, in cervical spine with significant trigger point pain uh, identified at multiple sites in the cervical and upper thoracic spine. X-ray revealed a reversal of the normal cervical lordosis, paradoxical motion at the posterior, indicative of a sprain, a strain, or whiplash injury. Now pain indices were noted to be eight or nine out of 10 and uh, right in five and six for some headaches, et cetera. So a six to eight week uh, treatment has produced a major uh, improvement. And this is according to this case study authored by um, Timothy Burkhardt, um, DC actually. So the result, uh, all of the symptoms abated within four to six weeks uh, due to the significant level of the improvement with the decompression table. Uh, and if a, a follow up later, uh, with cervical film was ordered to determine if additional rehabilitation would be indicated as ongoing support for the postural improvement of the loss of the cervical curvature. Now, um, these are my references. I like to appreciate everyone's time joining this uh, presentation. And uh, I'd like to thank my wonderful, uh, incredible preceptors, uh, Dr. Naka, Dr. Stein, and Dr. Burnett, uh, in the clinic um, that they help me to learn neurology and become a uh, good resident, future resident. Thank you so much. That completes my presentation.